what does God do in the world every year? That's what we're going to be talking about. And we're going to be, our text is going to be from the revelation of Jesus Christ, the book of the revelation of Jesus Christ. And we'll be in chapter 5, uh, verses 1 through 14. Revelation chapter 5 verses 1 through 14. In the Holy Scriptures we read, Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See the lion of the tribe of Judah. The root of David has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw a lamb, looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. The lamb had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. He went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Each one had a harp and they were holding golden bulls full of incense, which are the prayers of God's people. And they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals. Because you were slain, and with your blood you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands and ten thousand times ten thousand. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. In a loud voice they were saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. The four living creatures said, Amen. And the tw elders fell down and worshiped the word of the Lord. Yeah, you, you can say amen. It, it's acceptable in this place. Okay. <laughs> Father in heaven, we commit the word you have given to us back to you so that your Holy Spirit would bless this word about your Holy Son. We pray that uh, we would understand his glory, comprehend it today, and we pray that we would be more uh, knowing about your purpose, your plan, what you do every day and every year. We pray in Christ's name, amen. Even a brief consideration of what is happening in the world is enough to chill every heart, even the bravest of human hearts. What do we hear of every day, every week, every month, every year? It's the same old story. War, violent crime, terrorism, famine, deadly diseases, tornadoes, floods, hurricanes, earthquakes, fatal accidents, 
and on and on and on. In one sense, it is not surprising. In one sense, okay, here carefully. In one sense, it's not surprising that people try to escape from reality by drugs, alcohol, orgies, and other forms of distracting pleasures. Some people, they're just comp they have to be distracted every moment. That's all they can do is be distracted. Because if they're not distracted for one moment, if they begin to think, their whole inner being starts to short circuit. And so they turn to everything else excepting the one to whom they should turn, the true and the living God. And it should not surprise us when people who are not fully committed followers of the Lord Jesus Christ look at the world, listen to us talk about who God is, how God is in control of all things, and then they begin to challenge us, saying something like, if your God is in control, why is this happening? Or, what God, kind of God, as you say is a loving and holy God, would be in charge and allow all this evil to take place in the first place? Of course, they conveniently admit that they want to have the free will to do whatever they want, but uh, that gets overlooked in their challenge. Uh, sometimes we might get in such a place in our life where we even ask such questions ourselves, right? Uh, it can happen all too easily. Part of the answer is that our world is ruined because of human sin. God never tempts or impels anyone to sin. The book of James makes that very clear. If you or I sin, or I sin that sin is our choice. We wrongly think that sin is a superior choice. Every time you choose to sin, what you're doing, you're saying, I believe, God in heaven, that my way of doing things is so much better than yours. That's what we're actually doing. We might not want to admit to that, but even the best of Christian, when, when we sin, that's what we are actually saying. However, human sin is only part of the answer because God, who is sovereign over all people and all events, could easily stop anything and everything immediately. A uh, good example of that is to read Genesis chapter 20 when God confronts the pagan king and he says, uh, yes, Abimelech, I stopped you from touching Sarah. Okay, you can read that in Genesis 20. So, then we must seek from the Bible God's answer to what God is doing in the world every year. And a good place, place to see that is our text. Uh, the text begins with a problem in heaven. Uh, we read that in verses 1 through 4. Uh, a challenge comes from God's throne about this problem. Now, what is the scroll? It's the message of God's eternal plan, the true story of his glory in Jesus Christ. In order to properly understand the book of the Revelation, you and I must understand it's talking about Jesus Christ. It's saying so much about him and him being on the throne. From chapter 1 through chapter 22, the whole book is about Jesus Christ. It reaches from eternity to eternity, declaring God's purpose to reveal his glory 
in judgment on his enemies and also salvation for his chosen ones. The Bible is the true story of God's glory in Jesus Christ through salvation by judgment. Okay, that's always the base note of the story. God issues a challenge to all creation through his angel. Who can open my plans? Now, some of you know that I used to be in contracting. I was an estimator and a purchaser for a construction company. And we would get these plans, these blueprints, and they would come all rolled up. Yeah, I think an architect might know about this. Uh, all rolled up, and most times they would have rubber bands to keep them rolled up. And so you get the plans in the office because you have to start estimating. And so you have to take those rubber bands off and unroll the scroll. Well, that's sort of like what you see here, except you, this is sealed, not with rubber bands, but with other seals. Who can make them known or bring them to fulfillment? Who can declare or explain God's ex surpassing significance, God's overwhelming worth? Who can do this? Who, who can open the whole scroll of what God is doing? And then we see the inability of creation to meet that challenge in verses 3 through 4. A search of everything in creation revealed the complete unworthiness of all creation. No one has the capacity to disclose and to develop God's great plan. You cannot explain reality by starting from yourself and moving out. You cannot do this. This is the root failure of all human philosophy, opinions, and observations. God is not small. We are small. We are too limited. We lack wisdom. We lack power. We are unworthy. Who is worthy? No one was found worthy. Not one of us. Not the wisest professor in the best evangelical seminary in the world is worthy, is capable. John's response was to weep and to weep. Was he weeping out of frustration of not being able to know the future? Well, I'll grant that that might be a possibility. More likely, he wept out of a sense of loss, of meaning, of purpose, of destiny. Where, where is everything headed? You know, there, there aren't too many answers to that question. Either you have God's answer, that there is destiny, or you get caught in the male storm of human thought that thinks everything just goes round and round and round and round and round and infinite recycling of everything. You know, God has set eternity in human hearts. And we know there's destiny. But a lot of times people want to smash that and smash that idea, saying, no, there is no such thing as destiny. When the Bible says, it's appointed to all people to die once and after that to face judgment, right? There is destiny. That's the sad condition, though, of most people in our world. People have been smashed by Eastern religious philosophies and by the postmodern or hypermodern ideas of the West. All which say, humanity is nothing. There are no morals. There is no destiny. There is no hope. Paul tells us that about 
the unsaved world, without hope, without God in the world. What does an individual or a group of people really matter to worldly thinking? What do, what do they really think the individual matters? We have billions of people on this world. 7.3 billion so at last count? You know, what does one little person matter? Go ahead then. Fabricate news and information in the meeting, media. Go ahead and make up whatever story you want. There are no lies because there is no truth. See, if there is no truth, there can be no lies. So you can say anything that you wish to say. Oh, there are lies to people that are dumb enough to believe that there is truth. Right? I had a woman come up to me after I preached one Sunday and she says, there is no truth. You said you were very passionate about what you were saying, but there is no truth. And our building happened to have stone walls. And I said, if there is no truth, if there is no reality, because our conversation went on for a while, you see that stone wall? Go walking toward it and walk right through it if there is no reality. What do you think she said? I could if I wanted to, but I choose <laughs> not to. <laughs> I said, okay, I think our discussion is over. You just admitted defeat here. There is truth. The world says you're free to satisfy your lusts, your cravings for whatever you wish. What matters is your own happiness. Except that neither one really matters because nothing matters. And so pursue your own happiness, but that doesn't matter because happiness doesn't matter. Because there's really no such thing as happiness because there's really no such thing as unhappiness. It's only you might have a perception of that. This is the silliness of human thought. If you understand this darkness, weep. Yes, weep for people who have no ultimate meaning or significance. One of the great truths of Christianity is, is to everybody, you're significant. You were made in the image of God with an eternal destiny, and where you're heading has a lot of meaning. What's God's solution to the problem? in verses 5 through 10 that we've already read. Well, there's a startling presentation. There's a lion who is the lamb. Can you imagine the drama of this moment? One of the elders tells John not to weep because the lion of the tribe of Judah has triumphed. John thinks, about the elder's words to him. Yes, a lion, a noble, courageous, conquering champion. Surely he is able. But when John looks at the throne, what does he see? He does not see a lion. He sees a lamb. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't know how, how many knights and kings put on their shields and everything. Uh, a lamb. A lot of them put lions on their shields. Not too many went out with lambs as the sign of the conqueror. See, it's exactly at this point that God breaks the back of human wisdom. People wrongly think that a grand display of power is the way to handle what is wrong in the world. Just show enough power. If we can muster enough power, we can defeat the evil in this country. Go 
go ahead, drop the bombs, send in the armies, conquer, and evil will be gone. But after all our supposed human victories, evil remains as destructive as ever. We fail to listen to God's word, and therefore we don't understand the necessity of the lamb who died on a cross. Listen to the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Now what we probably should do is read the book of 1 Corinthians five times in a month, okay? We will build up to that, okay? 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. Where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand signs. Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach Christ having been crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to the nations. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. The only hope for your life is the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. The only hope for our church is the gospel. The only hope for our nation is the gospel. The only hope for our world is the gospel, the good news of our Lord Jesus Christ. As John Piper put it one time, God is the gospel. God is the good news. Thinking of the lamb on the throne, on the, you can look at that lamb on the throne in another way you can see that he is very special. The lamb is slain, but it's alive. Can your mind <laughs> deal with that? The lamb is having been slain, but he is alive with resurrection power, resurrection glory all around him. When you go back to chapter 1, when John saw him, in his glory, he fell on his face like a dead man. That's all John could do. Here is the Son of God with power, Romans 1, verse 4. The Lamb is standing. Where is he standing? In the center of God's throne. Not to the side. He's standing in the center of God's throne. Who's the king of the universe? He's the man who wore the crown of thorns. The Bible is the story of God's glory in Jesus Christ. Christ is the theme of the Bible. The lamb is the focal point of angels and mankind. They encircle him. All the angels, all the elders representing us, looking for meaning, joy, and life itself. The Lamb has power and wisdom. Now, where'd you get that, Pastor? He has seven horns, a horn. You know, whenever I, I was a pastor in a country church, Many years ago, I'd go around and visit farmers. And do you know what they did with any rams or any bulls that they had? They kept them in a special pen 
because those horns were their power, and they might go after you. Uh, the horn is a symbol of power. The eye, the symbol of wisdom. Seven horns, complete power. Seven eyes, complete wisdom. Seven spirit, the sevenfold spirit. He has the Holy Spirit. He's the one who pours out the Holy Spirit. He sends the Spirit, doing mighty works by him, by revealing himself by the Spirit of God. Then we see the explanation of the Lamb's worthiness. His sacrificial work on the cross and what it accomplished in verses 8 through 10. As the slain lamb, he purchased the people for God out of all humanity. This is the basis of evangelism and missions. Why seek anyone for salvation? Oh, there's good news in this verse, because God has purchased a people through his son. Okay, there are purchased people out there. We need to find the packages that have the name of Jesus Christ on them, okay? Now, anyone here get Amazon or UPS deliveries to their house? Okay. Now, what do you do when you get... Tell me, do you live, leave that package that's addressed to you out on your front porch? And you just don't care, you just walk by it day after day? No, no, you, you don't do that. Okay, what do you do? You bring the package in because it's yours. Here's what Jesus has given you and I to do, the privilege of going out and picking up the people that are addressed to him. Okay, that's our job. And so this is everything about evangelism and missions. He made the purchased people a kingdom, a new nation. We already saw this in Ephesians chapter 2. There's a better, a glorious human community formed by the Lamb. Aren't you glad that there's a better human community than Los Angeles, Seattle, New York, Houston? Miami, Boston, London, Beijing, right? You could go on and on. I'm very glad there's a better human community because if you read the book of Revelation, everything's heading toward a city, a new city called the New Jerusalem, see? And that's what he said. He's made us a kingdom. He's also made them priests. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you're a priest. Okay. Uh, just tuck that in your back pocket. It might come handy in ministering to people groups like the Mormons. Okay. You can say, I'm a priest. You're, you're coming with me with them. I'm a priest. I'm a priest in Jesus Christ. Now, he is the great high priest, right? Most definitely. We're able to worship God because we are in the great high priest and we bring our worship through our great high priest. That Whenever we come to a public worship, we ought to be consciously thinking, Father in heaven, I'm coming to you in the name, in the person of Jesus Christ for my worship. Uh, that is what we ought always to do. They worship on the basis of the slain and resurrected lamb. He guaranteed, guaranteed their reign on earth, ultimate victory. Now, I don't know what's going to happen to the eagles this year. Sometimes I wonder, you know. Just, <laughs> I always hope they're going to win that next Super Bowl, but that really doesn't matter in the whole scheme of things, does it, you know? Well, don't get too hung up on things like that. What matters is the fact that we have ultimate victory. Look, in all things, we are more than conquerors. 
through him who loved us. We're more than conquerors. What in the world is God doing? He's creating a new humanity in his son to share in the glory of God. One day you'll look a lot better than you do today, and most of us need to look a lot better, okay? <laughs> but when anybody sees you shining with the glory of God Almighty, well, you'll really be worth seeing on that day. Everything in history is the unrolling of God's plan. One by one, the Holy Spirit is putting purchased people in that new humanity. The most significant activity that you and I can get involved in is to be Christ's co-workers in God's plan. In other words, our mission, our mission is to make fully committed followers of Jesus Christ. That's what we need to be thinking about throughout the new year coming. It's our mission to make fully committed followers of Jesus Christ. And there's a lot that could be said about that statement. Thirdly, how does creation respond to God's solution? And while they respond in worship, verses 11 through 14. Think about the manner of worship. It was exuberant. It was excitement. There's a loud voice that's echoing throughout the heavens. They're singing. There's artistic expression of praise to God. If God made you a crow, then ca for the Lord when you sing. If God made you a nightingale, then sing with the beautiful voice of the nightingale. But please sing! <laughs> you know, if you want to know what you're going to be doing in heaven, you're going to be singing. So look at this. This is your practice, okay? Every week we come together, you get to practice making the rafters ring. I think I told this story, but we were down at Ocean City Bible Conference, and I have my eye watch on, and I'm sitting underneath the balcony, but the, the, whole, the roof seemed to raise as everybody was just joining to praise God. 400 people, and all of a sudden my eye watch goes off. Danger. <laughs> <laughs> High decibel warning. <laughs> yeah, I sort of figured that out. Along with that, there's also humility. Oh, how true Christianity stretches us. Not only is this loud, exuberant praise, but at the same time, we must be humble. You know, it's only by the Spirit you can join all that together. Then there's the confession. The amen is spoken to the glory of God. You know, it's so important to learn how to say amen. I mentioned this before. I, I, see, it's okay if you know you're repeating yourself. Okay. We need to learn to say Amen. We need to learn how to say hallelujah. We need to learn to say praise the Lord. As the truth is grabbing hold of your inner person as the word is preached, not because of the preacher, but because of the word, you should resound with a word of worship. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Amen. Hosanna. You know. Okay, and those are all words you're going to have to know in heaven, so get a head start on saying them. The substance of worship, everything is directed to God, including the Lamb of God. Everything is directed to God. Everything declares that all worthiness belongs to God. We're all, always supposed to live for the glory of God. So then... Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Okay, glory, God's worth, his surpassing value, his surpassing significance. That's what we're doing when we're giving glory to God. Uh, Achan, you tell the truth. Give glory to God. 
You know, did you take these things? Yes, I did. He confessed. Okay? I, truth, that's the glory of God. So whenever we say amen, what we're really saying is truth. Truth. Let it be so. That's truth. This is the final answer. What is God doing in the world this year and in everywhere? He's doing everything to declare his glory, his ultimate value, his significance. And you and I must bow before the true and living God and declare that everything we see testifies to his ultimate glory. Is this the passion of your heart? That's the question you must answer today. Do you have a passion for the glory of God? Or are you so concerned about all the little things that you never see the big picture of his glory? May God give us grace to embrace what God is doing in the world every year. Father in heaven, we pray that you would take this word, this beautiful passage of scripture, and emblazon it on our souls. We pray that we might have a passion this year to live for your glory every day of the year. In Christ's name, amen.